Um, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm kind of curious, uh, maybe the, the presenters can chime in. Do we see any names that we don't recognize? Any, any non-members? Yeah, there's a few names here that I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I I know Jen trains across the pond. Yeah, she's at JDI. Mm -hmm. Um, cool. So, quick introductions in case there are some of you who don't know who we are. Uh, my name is Jordan. I'm one of the co-owners of uh, SNS Strength. We lead SNS Barbell. Um, can we all go on mute if we're not talking? My bad. First time. Got you. It's all good. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, Jordan, one of the co-owners uh, of SNS Strength, and um, I have no formal education in injury risk reduction, so I'm going to lean heavily on what Clinton has to say today. Uh, we're also joined by uh, SNS staff, uh, Shane, one of our powerlifting coaches, kind of more in the, the power building style, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, Joe, one of the other co-owners of SNS, also one of our coaches. Uh, we have Nikhil here. Nikhil, did you get everything figured out? You all set up? Hi, yes. I'm all set up. Is, uh, SNS. And then, of course, we have the famous, the buff, the very attractive Clinton Lee, um, who's here today. He's our resident physical therapist at the Williamsburg location. So what we're going to do is we're going to, like I said, we're going to lean heavily on Clinton's expertise on this, but I'm going to go around and start by asking the coaches uh, what are kind of preferred, what are our go-to, maybe our number one injury risk reduction techniques are. So singular one technique. Um, I'll go from left to right on this kind of top banner here. So uh, Shane, you can go first. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in terms of um, from from a coaching perspective, um, one of the main things that I try to focus on to make sure that my athletes don't get injured and there's no like nothing special, but just like fatigue management and um, and how I'm structuring someone's program, um, making sure that I'm making this the small incremental changes per week. I'm not throwing too much volume or intensity at them in one in one uh, in one hit. And um, yeah, just making sure that they're, they're staying healthy and constantly trying to, um, you know, to communicate with them to make sure that they're um, giving me, you know, if, if, if they're doing too much for one week and they're telling me that they're really sore, um, then I'll like, I'll, you know, take the um, volume down a little bit for the following week and things like that. So um, yeah, it's just, it's just trying to manage fatigue and, and um, make sure I'm not giving them way too much that they're going to end up um, hurting themselves. Nice. Fatigue management. So that's if you're coached, and that's uh, kind of on the on the back of the coach, but also if you're if you're being coached, you should tell your coach if you're fatigued. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. That's pretty much it. Idea, I mean, one of the main easy. one of the main questions I ask my athletes, you know, when I'm doing a check in or something, is like, "How are you feeling? Like, are you you know, are you feeling strong? Are you feeling beat up? Like, if they're feeling beat up, then obviously that's something I can change for the following week and uh, and, and manage some of that load. Um, you know, take some drop a drop an accessory or drop a, drop some. Uh, some volume by taking a seat or two off. I like it. Uh, let's go with Joe next. Uh, yeah, from a coaching perspective, fatigue management is probably number one. Um, what else? Uh, trying to get athletes to understand auto regulation pretty early on because, you know, a lot of people train on their own, and Shane and I, and most coaches aren't there to be hands-on from the beginning. So if you have an athlete who understands auto-regulation and kind of is in tune to their body and fatigue levels and kind of how they're feeling, then you can kind of trust them to make better training decisions. And I think ultimately the more optimal training decisions you make, the less likely you have of getting injury, injured. Um, and then also I'm a big fan of, at least lately, is just general movement. Um, so some walking the bike, you know, kind of low intensity, just, just moving and outside of, you know, just getting under the bar and getting out of the gym. Um, yeah, those are, those are my go-tos, I think. And, you know, I'm fully unqualified for this <laughs> as well. You know, obviously as a coach, I have, ex you know, some experience with it, but Clinton is, uh, you know, he's the guy. 
I, I actually say probably number one. Find find a Clinton. Yeah, you want to exactly. not you want to not get injured. Find a Clinton. <laughs> yeah, mm. just to back up what Joe said about like, like you know general movement. Um, I always you know say like if, if someone's feeling stiff or sore, it's like just try to get steps in. Um, steps are such an underrated like uh, recovery tool in my opinion. Just trying to aim for that like six to ten thousand steps a day um, at a, at a you know moderate pace. Um, and that really sort of, you know, helps loosen things up a little. I like it. Uh, let's go with Nikhil next. Yeah, so uh, I think one thing that I really have to think about for myself, because, for example, with my lower back uh, pain that I've had to work on is just like getting better at warming up and uh, whether that even involves like the stretches that maybe if you have a PT who gives it to you, or it just involves with the movement itself. Just knowing how to warm up when you're actually warmed up and not just doing like a token single with the bar and call it a warm up. So like just that I think would be what I would really think about. Proper warm ups, And I think we're gonna get into that a little bit. I think we're gonna talk about that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer next and then we'll have, we'll save Clinton for last. So uh, I told Clint I wasn't going to say this, but I'll go ahead and go with the dynamic warm up. So for those of you who haven't been coached by me, um, you should consider yourself lucky. But uh, I, I, I would have all of my athletes start each training session with a dynamic warm up. Uh, it was taught to me by a guy named Dr. Mike Zordos, who uh, was my coach at Florida State. And now he's a professor at FAU, Florida Atlantic. Um, it used to be that you could just search in dynamic warm up on YouTube and you'd see Mike performing it. Uh, but I think the video has been taken down. Yeah, he took it. To, it drives me crazy that he took that down. Why did he take it down? No, no know idea. It's an alternative, but maybe he hates it's social media. Time. It's like he, an, de it's like, he definitely hates social media. Social media. <laughs> it's like a, an in sync dance routine that, that, that you can no longer find on. on yeah, my, I'm not going to lie. When I first started at SNS and I seen everyone doing it, I thought it was like, yeah, I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. yeah but it's effective. I still do it to this day. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's a bit of like, do as I say, not as I do. Because I, I, I... I've never seen you do it. I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm also retired, so. Uh, all right. Um, so the, I think we, we kind of got a word from each of our um, kind of speakers, except for, of course, Clinton. Uh, the rest of this is going to be mostly falling on the shoulders of Clinton. Um, he's going to go over kind of joint specific injury reduction techniques. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time on that. And um, yeah, Ken is nagging me in the chat. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, he's going to go over joint specific injury risk reduction techniques. And after that, we'll take our submitted questions. And then after that, we'll do some live questions. So um, and, and hold on, I'm going to wait for this for Vincent to join. For the two of you who, who just joined, we just went over um, kind of a little round table, favorite injury risk reduction techniques. Clinton's going to go over joint specific stuff. And then after that, we'll do various Q and A's. So Clinton, all yours. All right, cool. Jordan, I think your, um, <clears throat> I think your, your best like dynamic warm up is waiting until I get to like my first working set of like 175 kilos on a deadlift and you just come in and then you, you pull that as your warm up, and then like and then you jump to like like 500 pounds or something like that but <laughs> yeah but to yeah, your credit like is, is dynamically jumping from platform to platform yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah I I love all the I love all the responses so far like I think you guys hit all like the big points about uh injury risk reduction um I think one of the, the the simplest ways to think about like why we get hurt, and I think this is so important that I'm actually gonna like type it into the um, the chat because we'll, I'll probably refer back to this like in um, like throughout the session here is that like what what is an injury really right like why do we get hurt and simply put like an injury occurs when the load that we place in our bodies greatly exceeds our capacity to withstand that load. So um, when you think about the things that that Coach Shane and Coach Joe and, and Coach Jordan mentioned, right, like, um, Shane, I think you said like fatigue management, right? Joe, I think you said, um, like auto regulation, right? So these are all elements of managing, like, 
how much work you're putting into your body, right? Um, the feedback that you give that an athlete gives to their coach is really important because then the coach can then program load that's tolerable for for the athlete. Um, the way we so any answer so you you guys got to be like you guys are way too modest like you are all qualified to, as 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 powerlifting coaches to speak on you know pragmatic solutions towards getting stronger and reducing injury risk so so um i i think i think you guys are like yeah hitting the nails on the head um making sure that again like you you're increasing your capacity to with withstand load um if someone is like kind of toast like one week you're you're reducing the load the workload on their body so that they um they can they can withstand their their training for that day um this term load too like i i think in a powerlifting context we all think about like oh what is load load is the the weight on the bar right in in the most simplest terms and it most certainly is um that's the most objective way to think about about what load is but um in this with this little equation here injury equals load uh, injury occurs when load is much greater than capacity. Um, load is anything that can put like a stress on ourselves, right? So, um, if you're having a really tough like work week, right, and you're you're working many more hours than you're typically used to, let's say you're sitting for for longer, or um, and you're just like your your emotions that can influence the way you feel. Like these are all like elements of load that need to be managed, which is why like you know if if we all like if if we're comfortable squatting a certain weight um like typically and then for whatever reason um all other things equal one day like we one week we just don't tolerate it that well and then you ask your athlete oh what's going on like is everything all right and then like there are non-physical things that cause these um you know the, the load to exceed our capacity to tolerate them so um yeah so just just managing every element of what stresses an athlete um, are going to be ways to help reduce uh, injury risk. So, um, yeah. And then I think um, something that I'll, like one of my favorite, I'll, I'll kind of take this in like a different direction. So um, one of the ways that I love reducing injury risk is single joint work, right? So um, single joint work, meaning when we squat, right? Like you're using it's a compound movement. You're using like your glutes, so like your hips, your knees, and a little bit of your ankles, like your lumbar spine, like all that comes together to form a squat. Um, <clears throat> let's say someone's having knee pain, choose exercises that work specifically on the knee. What does the knee do? The knee extends, right? The, it's the work of the quadriceps and the knee flexes, right? The work of like hamstrings among other things. So um, focus on isolating that joint and increasing the work capacity of of that joint to tolerate um things like like the squat right um when when we do like compound movements like a squat who we we don't know if like you know sometimes the, the glutes are, are doing more work than than the knee um over time if there's like an imbalance between you know how much like one muscle contributes to the movement versus the other um that can potentially lead to problems so uh, it's good to isolate joints and work on things uh, specifically. Um, yeah, so um, I like a lot of the other things that you guys said too. Um, Joe, I think you said something about like staying active, getting your steps in, moving around. Um, I, I had another thing in my notes here about like diversifying training. So doing active stuff other than powerlifting, right? Um, I, you know, when, like, when I first got into, like, the powerlifting space as, as a physical therapist, when I heard the term, like, GPP, like, general physical preparedness, I'm like, oh, that, that sounds a lot like, like, PT stuff, right? So, that's one of the reasons why I love, like, powerlifting and, and physical therapy and, you know, and, and the overlaps, right? Like, a lot of the, the strategies that powerlifting coaches and, and athletes do, it's it's like the building blocks of why like someone can rehab an injury or or create resilience in like their lumbar spine or or their joints and stuff like that right like you're 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 doing you're diversifying the the ways in which your body can tolerate loads you know whether it's um doing stuffing up you know doing stuff under a barbell um getting away from barbells and like just 
keeping your body like more versatile in terms of like the loads that it can it can withstand. So um, yeah, if if you've there, there's a bunch of people in this room who I think I've worked with on on various things. Um, if you've had like low back pain, one of the the most like kind of like practical but also effective things that I, I have people do is like stay moving, right? Like don't allow your body to fall into this 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 pattern of like sedentarism, right? Where you just kind of you know sit for long periods of time. You're you're lying down. Um, your body really settles into like specific postures, and that just kind of amplifies your pain response because you're when you're in pain, your body is already so protective and um, it's afraid to, to move. So every new movement, your body is still in protection mode. It's like, oh, what's that? Like, I don't like that. And then you get this kind of like defense mechanism coming from your central nervous system to, um, to, um, to just like freeze up, you know? So um, get your steps in, um, you know, which is tough during a pandemic. People are commuting a lot less. I think that so, right, anecdotally that increases a lot of, uh, you know, you know, pain in people. To back up a second, Clint, I wanted to get a, uh, your thoughts on something. Uh, yeah. That when you were talking about the kind of the GPP-esque line of, of thinking, uh, the head coach at on it in Austin, uh, Texas, says that his favorite thing to do is to hammer the muscles that you don't know that you have. So I, I want to get your thoughts on that statement in terms of injury risk reduction. Yeah, I can. Uh, is that Joe Rogan, by the way? Is he the uh, the the coat? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, I think he goes there. But that's not <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Um, I don't know if I would hammer them. Like, so I, I, I like that from, like, a general viewpoint. I think it's good to do stuff that your body is not used to doing. Um, but, like, I, I think GPP in a way is more towards the active recovery end of the spectrum of the things versus like high performance. So I, I think it's, I think it's beneficial to do, um, to work on muscles that you feel like you, you seldom use because it's not that you don't use them. It's you, you use them in more subtle ways. Right. So by, by working those muscles, you're, you're allowing those seemingly like seldom used muscles to do their job a little bit more efficiently when you do do your, your high performance stuff. Um, and it depends on the individual, right? Like, um, from what I understand, most people that on it are like they're they're beasts, right? Like they're they're very strong. Um, they've been around for a long time. They can probably tolerate like the more diverse workouts. Powerlifters, I think, we're a little bit more specialized, right? We're focusing mostly on the the squat bench and the deadlift. We're trying to get as strong as we can on those things. Um, I think that can be a strength. I think that can be a potential weakness in some people. Um, if you're looking to establish like, you know, the highest single on, on a squat bench or a deadlift, right? That kind of specificity allows us to hone in on very specific aspects of, of strength and, and components of strength. Um, at the same time, like it allows us to maybe neglect certain things on, you know, until it's too late. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I, I like that. that. That kind of alludes also to what I was mentioning before about like single joint work. Um, I, I love rotator cuff work. It's very like, it doesn't like, I'm, I'm always hesitant to prescribe like kind of unconventional exercises to power lifters uh, because I think they're a hard sell. Sometimes they don't really contribute to our total or to our strength or really to our aesthetics. Right. So it's, it's kind of a hard sell, but the best sell for single joint work, like especially rotator cuff work is that it will help reduce the risk of you getting an injury so that you can you can continue to do all the stuff that contributes to strength and hypertrophy hypertrophy and, and aesthetics right so like my go-to rotator cuff exercise is like picture this is like a like a dumbbell just holding holding your arm like so and then rotating up like this right like this is pretty boring right it's not sexy or anything like that but um you're working on like stabilization muscles in your in your rotator cuff that is going to help like the uh, the stability of your your glenohumeral joint or like the ball and socket joint of your shoulder, which is going to prevent a lot of stuff down the road, especially if you're you know you're benching pretty aggressively like three times a, three times a week, like I feel like most of us are. Also, it's it's typically not very sexy, but when Clint demonstrates it, I think we could all. Oh, <laughs> I was only because I was flexing extra hard just then. Maybe that that's why it's my favorite exercise, right? <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh, really a good time to mention, if you guys have questions, I see a few people throwing questions in the chat. It's a good thing to do. 
Uh, but if they come to you, put them in the chat and we can talk about them later. Oh yeah. Should we, should we go down the, the list now? I see some, um, well, yeah. Cause I think they're relevant to what you were talking about. Maybe it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesse, you wrote an analgesic effect too, in regards to, it was something I mentioned earlier. Um, like, um, yeah. So isometric exercises have an analgesic effect. Although I, I recall reading some research saying, so the original school of thought regarding isometric work. So an isometric exercise is like, let's say if I'm, let's say if this is a wall and I'm, I'm putting my fist against the wall and I'm pushing hard against it, right? Like, obviously I'm not going to push the wall down, but all my muscles are like contracting hard to, to do that pushing motion. So that that's considered like an isometric contraction. So it was thought that exercises like that, um, um, have like a, a pain relieving kind of like effect to it. Um, and I think that's true, but I also read something recently that said that it, that's not just isolated to, to isometric exercises. Right. So like there's like, uh, in a more general sense, a lot of exercise in general have these, these pain relieving properties. Part of that is, um, is, is chemical, right? We have, we have these things called like endogenous opioids in our body where they're, they're basically like your body's natural, like painkillers. Right. So a good example is it like when, if you run, right. I don't know if we have a lot of runners in this group, right. <laughs> but, um, but like the endorphins you get from running has a little bit of like a pain relieving effect to that. Um, so, uh, the, it's isometric exercises kind of have that pain relieving property to it. Um, but there's also like psychological effects of exercise that have these pain reducing elements to them as well. So, um, yeah, I think you may have mentioned that in regards to like my isometric stuff, like for, for the rotator cuff for the shoulder, if you have a lot of acute pain, sometimes the only tolerable thing one can do are those isometric exercises, right? Like I don't know if anybody has had, like, I feel like shoulder injuries are pretty common among powerlifters, but if you ever have like, you know, a, like a shoulder injury, sometimes it's hard for like to, to lift your arm up, let alone like press a barbell. But if you can get your arm into what's otherwise like an aggravating position and just do an isometric exercise in that aggravated position, then that's one way that's like an entry point towards loading your shoulder again. And that can, um, that can reduce pain. That can be a gateway into doing more like heavy exercises and, and stuff that's more conducive towards like building your muscles again. Um, I guess we'll just keep going down the list here. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, so Jesse is, is, um, is, is, is also corroborating that like all exercise have analgesic effects. <laughs> he has some exogenous ones going on right now. Exogenous. Okay. Yeah. I know what he's doing anyway. Um, cool. So, um, before we get into the Instagram questions, do, we'll, do you want to get into the Instagram questions at a good time? Clinton? Uh, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Okay. Before we do that, any, any practical takeaways from what Clinton said from the coaches? Uh, yeah, I think kind of, uh, I don't want to go too deep into this, but like, you know, I, as I progress as a coach and spend more time doing it, I've, I'm finding more use in periods of very low specificity in terms of just powerlifting um, and just kind of reducing some of the stress, the, the stresses that we accumulate from just, you know, hammering you know, highly specified movement all the time. Um, and I think for a couple of things, it kind of, you know, mentally it feels good for a lifter to not just, you know, do the same thing all the time. So you have a stress reduction. I believe you have a stress reduction there where if training becomes fun again, you know, you're probably going to feel a little bit better about going into the gym. And then also like there are ways to still, you know, benefit our total training goal without just doing swap inch deadlift um you know tertiary movements that'll complement that but also kind of eliminate or, or at least take some time away from just loading these positions that we're constantly loading and hammering um you know that's kind of i've been experimenting with that a lot more the past year year or so and i found some pretty good success with it uh and then to piggyback on clinton i i often prescribe a lot of unilateral movements, um, stuff that I think is complementary to squat bench and deadlift, stuff that focuses on single joint, 
um, you know, things that help her balance, things that force an athlete to move a little bit more specifically than they would, you know, just under a bilateral movement. Cool. Yeah, I agree with what Joe said about like, um, obviously the variation in exercises and, and not trying to be super high, hyper specific all year round. Um, and I'm sure most of you have seen my programming and it's, it's pretty well, um, you know, there's a lot of variety in there in terms of the variations and the accessory stuff, but. Yeah, it's like um, Joel, Joel Seedman. Yeah, Joel Seedman stuff. Um, but yeah, like obviously, you know, depending on the person um, and, and if they have any like nagging injuries or anything like that, but like things like, you know, putting, um, you know, a, a lift is, um, you know, bench press in like a shortened position or like, you know, trying to get um, strong on, on all ends of the range of ranges of motion. Um, not just sort of hammering the same shit over and over again. I feel like that helps a lot with a lot of um, people in terms of pain management and um, keeping injury free long-term. So Shane, what I heard is never below 90 degrees uh, joint angle. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's um, go ahead and dig in to these uh, submitted questions. So uh, first question I think I, I talked about this a little bit. Let's see if Clinton agrees. What's a general warm up you advise for the big three lifts? Yeah, so um, this is, I, I think the, the dynamic warm is that, that Jordan was talking to that, that Mike had that, that video about. Um, I love those because, like, so dynamic meaning um, these, are, these, are, these are movements that maybe produ produce like a quick stretch. And you're moving with like, like pretty considerable velocity, right? As opposed to holding a certain position and prolonging this 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 long duration of like a of like a stretch sensation, um, it gets your blood flowing a little bit more. It primes your nervous system to um, to do like not just explosive movement, but to like to tolerate like load and to to withstand heavy load. Um, and you want them to be in planes of movement that are relative to to powerlifting. Um, so anything that involves like hip flexion, right? Hip flexion meaning like if you picture yourself lying on your back and then you you're lifting your leg up toward the ceiling. So that that motion is is hip flexion, right? You can do that in like a fast motion, like you're trying to kick up to the to the ceiling. Um, more simply, you can stand and like hold on to something for balance, and you're just whipping your leg up into flexion and, and extension, right? So you're gonna get like a quick stretch in your hamstring. You're also getting a little bit of um, like movement into your sciatic nerve and all the branches of the sciatic nerve, uh, which is important because like you want to, you, you want your nervous system and you want your lumbar spine to be like prepared to, you know, to, to take some considerable loading throughout your workout, right? Um, what else? So, well, Jesse yeah. asked, why not just get under the bar? So, I guess maybe you can get into the spectrum of just get under the bar, a dynamic warm up, and then something like a ballistic warm up. Yeah. So, this is um, this is a good question that I actually had that that someone had asked on my my Instagram as well, but I, I didn't get to answer it. Um, I think getting on the bar is excellent for for a lot of people, but um. I think there is also some benefit in, like we were talking about like diversifying uh, like movement before, right? So even though getting under a bar and just warming up with the bar prepares us specifically for like a specific like squat pattern or, or a specific movement, we're not just using that movement entirely, right? Like there's small degrees of like rotation that occur in our joints that you're going to, that you're going to benefit from getting more dynamic moves from. So, um, we don't, we don't do rotational movements during squat bench nor deadlift. Right. But it's, it's good to rotate your lumbar spine because you're opening up your facet joints. You're, you're promoting more like diffusion of synovial fluid through your joints too. Um, again, in, in ways that are different than, than your typical squat pattern and your, and your, your bench pattern and, and stuff like that. Uh, you could do that with accessories after, but you're also remember like the, the purpose of like movement prep is you're you're trying to prepare the environment of your nervous system and your joints to to take on the work coming from um, 
what you're going to do in your your workout set. So um, I, I think accessories doing them afterwards definitely has the purpose of like building resilience and you're making your joints more robust and and things of that nature. But in the context of like warming up and preparing for like your big three, um, there, there's going to be more merit in doing it like prior. They answer your question, Jordan, regarding like the uh, the ballistic stuff and. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I know when when Mike was telling us to do the dynamic warm up, he uh, oh, Je Jesse's uh, not convinced. Maybe we'll have him hop on and yeah, and a little bit when we do the Q and A in here. Jesse, Jesse, on my um, on my uh, my Q and A, the like one of the questions was uh, what's something that that I changed my mind about recently, and the thing I was going to say was I used to think that um, the only warm up you really need if you're going to squat is to squat with the barbell and then put on like your, your first work warm up set and then squat with that. And then, and then you'll, you'll be prepared. But, um, that, that's something I recently changed my mind on. Like, um, if I can give like an anecdotal example, um, like if, like a couple of years ago, that's, that's the warm up that I did. Like I was just like, if I was going to squat, like I'm just going to warm up with my squat. If I'm going to bench, I'm just going to warm up doing like the bench and stuff. And given the amount of load that like, I'm, I'm not like a super competitive power lifter, but so, so for, for the working, for the, for the sets that I was doing for myself and the, the amount of work that I was doing, it was sufficient for me to just warm up like that. Um, in, in recent years, I've been trying to like push my performance like a little bit more. I found that that wasn't enough. Right. So like, I, I think something that reconciles like our points of view is that it depends, this is where the individual, it matters, right? If, if I am not a super, I'll use, I keep using the word competitive, right? But like, let's say I'm working well within like a tolerable, like working load. Maybe I don't need that extra like body weight stuff. Maybe I could just jump right into it and like, knock on wood, I hate saying this, but like, I, I haven't really been hurt. Uh, it feels weird even to say, I haven't been hurt in a long time, like without like, yeah, thanks. Uh, but, um, but like during that whole time where I didn't do these ballistic movements and dynamic warmups, like I didn't get hurt, right? Um, so I, I think that warm up was enough for me. And I started to feel more pains as I was pushing my performance. And that's why I think I had to include the dynamic stuff and the ballistic stuff. I felt like I was just trying to like, you know, hedge my bet a little bit in terms of like um, reducing risk and, and things like that. So, so that, that answer is different for, I think a lot of people, you know. Clinton's gonna promptly sprain his finger clicking the end meeting button. Yeah, that was bad. I I, should, <laughs> I hate putting that thought in the universe, right? Like everyone felt it, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, uh, I can also um, give my own personal an anecdote here. As I get older, I, I find myself um, feel, feeling more and more guilty for not doing a dynamic warm up before I train because uh, I feel the kind of aches and pains becoming more frequent. Um, and that actually leads into the next question that we have here, um, and I'll just read it as is, and we can kind of decipher it in a second, is, and if so, when is, age an independent factor, I think you meant independent variable, in considering injury risk, as in if you have the exact same presentations, everything, but age is different? That's a good question. All, all the, the question is insinuating uh, all other things equal, right? I'm not sure. I was going to say, I was going to give my answer of like, it depends on the training age of the person. But I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think if the, the question, so like a scenario that that question is, is proposing, right? Let's say you have a 21 year old who has, who has been working out for 10 years of like, since he was like a kid. Right. And then you take like, um, a 75 year old and he's been working out for 10 years as well from age 65 to 75. And all other thing, all other things equal, right? Like medical history equal no other um, significant like things in their medical history, no cardiovascular disease, no autoimmune disorders, and stuff like that. Would the the older person be at a greater risk of injury? I think I think I'm getting too hypothetical with this because like there's there's too much stuff to standardize. Like let let's assume that you're putting the let, let's say you're even controlling for the amount of load and volume between those two people. Yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe I'll answer your, that question in a less like specific way. Um, yeah, the, the question, it's kind of difficult to pull apart the question from age versus training age, right? Because if age is the independent factor, then you would have to imagine um, 
that your you, you know your 70 year old patient who has an entire training history uh, of building all kinds of strength would be in better shape than somebody who's at the same age yeah uh, but yeah i guess I, i'm not also not exactly sure how to answer that question yeah because it's it's kind of impossible to control for like the the amount of load placed on the joints between the 21 year old and the 75 year old right like um the let's i'm, I'm going to change the question a little bit and answer it that way because i think it's going to be a little bit more like like pragmatic to do that like let's say let's say the 75 year old just by being a like a normal ass 75 year old like he's got some aches and pains in his joints right like th this dude has he, he's got some miles like on the on the tires right um if he does the same weight and workout as someone that's 21 that doesn't have the same amount of load placed on their joints and you know they're if i i think he's probably going to have like a little bit more of a risk factor but then again that's not a function of age that's a function of the load i'm sorry i don't i don't know how to answer that question but um what do you guys think? Uh, I would give the traditional cop out answer of it depends, or right? is it's probably varies individual to individual. I mean, ask Dave Ricks. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, is, that's a tough one. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to it's my um, my my equation in the beginning, right? Like an injury injury occurs when load exceeds capacity, regardless of your age. If you've prepared for the if that 75 year old like gradually progressed up to his current like training regimen and he does that like you know conservatively and he's not overshooting and he's getting adequate recovery i wouldn't say that that person is necessarily at a greater risk than a 21 year old who does <clears throat> more load you know like like that that injury equals load greater than capacity is going to be different between like between that 21 year old and the 75 year old so i guess another way to frame the question is um is there anything inherent in like the tissue of the body it's purely based on age um, that will expose you to greater risk? Yeah. So, so yeah, that answer does is orthopedic yes. cost exist is basically the question, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to word it without. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Oh God. I was that, like, that, the, but you got to it naturally. That's what, is there anything inherently inherent in the biology that all 75 year olds can expect? Or is it just always, N equals one, you know? Yeah. What, what Sorry, I'm like, like walking um, my dog in the rain. Hormonal changes as you get older make a difference too, Clinton. Like, for example, if you have a like a 21-year-old guy that's been training, you know, for a couple of years, his, say, his testosterone levels are at like, you know, say, 800 or 900. And then as he, 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 he keeps everything the same, you know, sleep-wise, nutrition-wise, as he gets older, and then he gets into his 40s and his, his testosterone drops down to like, two or 300 or something like that. Yeah. Um, do you think that that could play a performance in as like things like recovery and like um, muscle protein synthesis and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, I, I believe so. So that, that kind of like, um, that's similar to like Jordan's questions before, like there's, so there's definitely like histological changes in people's tissues over time. Um, I forget the specific age. I think it's like 26 or something, but one's ability to, like synthesize protein and to to put on like lean mass it starts to it, it peaks at like don't, don't quote me this 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 needs verification but like it peaks at a certain age and i believe the age right. is in like your your 20s right so all other things equal if we're just looking at the nature of people's tissues and stuff um someone that is older just for the sake of time like we're we're all in a fight against time right like everybody diseases like you know at, at some given point so naturally our bodies are going to experience um aging and they're not going to be able to withstand force as much as someone that's younger right but um it's it may not be like it's not necessarily pathologic for that for that person that you mentioned to lose that much on their total right because right. it's it, eventually it's going to happen to to all of us and we're just trying to hang on uh, that's, that's kind of a pessimistic way to do it but we're, we're trying to do as much as we can given our capacities no matter what age we are even if over the long term that that's going to be at a decline let's let's try to prolong that as much as possible and let's reduce that decline as much as possible until like we're as old as we can be
Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I want to um, kind of push through the next questions here so we can make sure anybody here who wants to ask questions can get that time in. Uh, so let's do some quick ones. Thoughts on cryotherapy for chronic injuries? Yeah, so um, from what I've read, I, I feel like a, a lot of I've the topic of recovery is like really fascinating to me because the more I read about it and the more evidence I, I, I read about, the more I discover that like, not to be pessimistic, but like nothing works. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. So yeah. yeah. This, um, this sounds like Jordan talking. Yeah. Except foam, foam rolling, right? <laughs> like, so um, the, the short answer to that is, is no. Like cryotherapy, um, it, it might reduce pain, but the, the thing about chronic pain, chronic pain is not inflammatory in nature. So introducing like a cold stimulus to, to reduce like whatever effects chronic pain is having, like there's no, the, like the mechanism doesn't, it, it, it just doesn't make sense, right? That being said, there's, there's always like a, a follow-up, like that being said, um, I don't think cryotherapy is dangerous. I think cryotherapy feels good. Um, I think cryotherapy assists recovery in the sense that you you might feel you might symptomatically feel better, like like following icing something, right? And if you subjectively feel better, and that allows you to get into the gym like the next day with a little bit more like vigor and a little bit more motivation and you're feeling a little more like loosey goosey like i mean that's that's kind of recovery in a sense too right so um the the short answer is it doesn't help with chronic pain the the, the more nuanced answer is like anything that subjectively makes you feel better can be somewhat consist can can be kind of considered as like like a potential recovery modality. So that's why like, I'm okay with foam rolling, right? Like I used to be, I, I posted this on my Instagram recently too. I said like, oh, I used to be like vehemently against foam rolling. Like, ah, it doesn't do anything. Like don't do it at all. But like some, some the, the people that go to SNS, right? Like we, we got people that train what? Like 12 to 16 hours in a given week. Let's say they spend like point, like 0.02% of that time foam rolling. It doesn't take away from the training. It, it, there's like, there's no financial cost to it. There's, there's no like nocebo cost to it. Right. Like they're not, they're not fearing like, Oh, if I don't do this, my, my joints are going to break. Like, I, I think people aren't like super, like, you know, th they don't have that thought. So like there, there's nothing wrong with taking a very short amount of time to rub your body against like a foam roller and having your quad feel like subjectively good before you go into like a squat or something like that. So, so that, that's going to be my, my main answer for like topics about like, like cold, heat, stimulation, acupuncture, cupping, um, what is it? Like uh, infrared therapy, meditation, smoking weed, um, watching Netflix, right? Like um, whatever, like all that stuff is, is legit to a certain extent because it makes you subjectively um, – more comfortable and prepared to take on your workload the next day. So not not quite a quick answer, but um, it, it's worth dwelling on for a minute because we covered more than just cryotherapy. We covered um, kind of evidence based therapies, right? And um, and there's an important point to be made about um, opportunity cost because a lot of people say if cryotherapy makes me feel better, then I should do it. And in fact in the professional world and professional sports, that mindset is kind of running rampant in that some of these not evidence-based um, kind of training methodologies, um, the um, Jolteans of the world <laughs> are, are losing popularity based off the idea that if, if it makes the athlete feel better, then it's good for them. Well, you know, to bring it home, we discussed cryotherapy, uh, Clinton and I, uh, uh, at SNS, uh, because we have some space, we wanted to see if we can put that in there. Clinton told us that it's not very efficacious. And so we said, you know what? It, that, that, well, that's a great example of opportunity cost. Because if we would have put that cryotherapy system in the gym, it would have been at the cost of another thing we could have put in the gym, right? Uh, because we have limited space. So that's a very easy way to say, 
the 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 opportunity cost is real. Uh, so let, let's go ahead and move on. Um, let's let's try to be quick on this one, although this is a, a pretty important one, and I'm actually very interested to hear the answer. What are some tips to reduce tendonitis? Um, this person specifically is interested in elbow or shoulder pain. Mm -hmm. uh, heavy, slow resistance. So tempo work specific to the muscle that has tendonitis. Yeah, so um, said elbow, like, so a lot of people that have like, like lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, like very slow wrist extensions up, very slow wrist extensions down. And so that, that's gonna have some restorative properties to the tendon that has a little bit of a, some strain or degeneration in it. HSR, heavy, slow resistance. Love it. Uh, when is static stressing useful? Or put another way, is static stressing, uh, stretching useful? Ooh, that's a good question. I Currently, I'm grouping that under the, if it makes you feel good and it has a low opportunity cost, you can do it. But I will rarely have someone specifically static stretch something unless if they have some sort of extenuating circumstance, like if they have adhesive capsulitis or like their, their shoulder is like so like inflamed and stuck in a certain position, um, I might have them do some gentle static stretching. But I would say for like 99% of people that come to SNS, I, I don't know if it really has any benefit unless it makes you feel good. And even then just do it a little bit, you know? The, the, the dynamic warm-up was uh, recommended to us in place of static stretching uh, and, and Dr. Zoros was vehemently opposed to mm. any sort of static stretching um, for whatever that's worth. Uh, we have a question recommended over a warm-up, which I think we, we answered adequately, did we? Yeah, which one? The um... Just recommended over a warm-up. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, oh, this one's interesting. Can you talk about the different types of bars for lifting, power, Olympic deadlift, when to use? Is there a, a way to frame that in regard to injury risk reduction? Maybe. I'm, the, the first thing that comes to mind is like, um, I'm, I'm thinking of like a stiff bar versus um, like a deadlift bar. If you have a lot of whip, in the bar and let's, so let's say your, let's say you, someone has low back pain with deadlifting, right? And let's say their low back pain is triggered when they, they have relatively fast, like rate of force development, right? Um, like from what I just, and, and coaches feel free to correct me on this, but if, if you're deadlifting with a deadlift bar, right? Like there's a little bit more because there's whip in the bar, there's a little more initial velocity on the, on, when it's coming off the ground, that could potentially be something that aggravates someone's pain. Um, you know, if if that's something that triggers someone's pain, I might ask have them do a stiff bar at a at a tolerable weight where they don't have to where they can avoid that that trigger and they're just kind of like getting into position, getting tight, bracing, and then they're they're approaching the movement a little more more slowly. Um, the other specialty bars like uh, the transformer bar and th those are all any bar that shifts the center of gravity of the weight on your on your body like differently from like a regular straight barbell um you can make that more difficult for yourself or you can make that like easier for yourself right like if you shift the the lever arm like further away from your center of gravity that's going to be tougher that could potentially increase the the injury risk of someone if they're already dealing with some sort of pain or if they have some something significant in their medical history um let's say someone is coming back from an injury and they're they haven't been squatting for a long bit of time give them a specialty bar that places the weight in a mechanically advantageous position so that it's easier on their lower back maybe their torso is a little more upright and it's just a lot more tolerable hey. Yeah, I'll give you my, my coaching perspective on, on mechanical advantage. So, you know, this idea, there's a, this idea, and I think it's kind of antiquated at this point. Um, I think it, it's a more of a West Side methodology. Um, putting yourself in greater mechanical disadvantage is somehow a good thing. Uh, the, the sport of powerlifting is all about finding every piece of mechanical advantage you can. Um, so putting yourself in a worse position isn't better because it's more difficult. In fact, I would 
10 times out of 10 recommend put yourself in a better position and put more load on the bar. Um, and, and that will result in a better outcome. Totally agree. I agree. Um, to piggyback on that, the specialty bars. So, I mean, I don't know if there's much difference between the stiff bar, the deadlift bar and the weightlifting bar, but you know, in my go-to protocol with an athlete who has shoulder discomfort or shoulder pain or who can't low bar, can high bar is the safety spot bar or the duffalo bar something that reduces the demand to be in a position that you know causes pain and those the specialty bars are you know that's probably the best tool we have for that the trap bar you know there's there's so many ways basically in any individual circumstance whatever you could do to work around that discomfort so they can continue training to somewhat you know somewhat of a similar specificity like yeah that's huge super important I would also extend that to the accessory machines that we have because in New York City you have limited space in a gym and we chose every piece of equipment that we have at both locations to make sure that if you have some sort of injury from squat, for example, that you can have a way to maintain lower body training volume without putting strain on your back, for example. And that's why we, we like the reverse hyper in that you can actually... Um, uh, you could, instead of putting compression on your back uh, while loading the lower body, you can put your, your back in decompression while lo uh, loading the lower body, which is a nice way to make sure we maintain that volume uh, so we don't run the risk of introducing atrophy and then having to retrain up and potentially um, introduce injury risk there. Uh, so let's get these next couple in real quick. And then what do you think, Clint, another 10 or 15 for the folks here who have questions? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so this one, we can do this one really quickly because it seems pretty specific to the person who's asking the question. Are dynamic warm up slash mobility drills necessary for an athlete with hypermobility and subluxation, which is a word I've never heard before? Mm -hmm. So, subluxation is kind of like a partial dislocation. Um, it's, it's not like a joint completely coming out of the socket, but it, there is like a little bit of like a, a shift, right? So, um, my short answer is yes. Um, the the in, the magnitude of the dynamic warmups though has to be within the range of motion and control requirements of the person that's hypermobile. Nice. That's pretty much uh, it. Last uh, Instagram question, and then we'll take it to the audience here. So, what are the factors you look at when deciding how much or how fast to push intensity-wise during rehab from an injury? Ooh, mm. I'm I so. The way I answer this, this is this, again, this is one of the reasons why I love powerlifting and, and physical therapy kind of like in the same environment. Like, I think my answer to this is almost exactly the same as like what, what a coach would, would say, right? Like the, the presence of an injury, all, all that means is that pain is going to be present, right? Like at, at a certain load. But I, I feel like even if pain is not present, that's how a powerlifting coach would, would approach like managing someone's like programming anyway right like can they can they handle this weight right like do does their form falter does it do they compromise position to to do so are they um i don't know are, is their form going to going to crap basically if if i give them like this this certain load so um yeah i i think my answer to that is similar to how like a coach would would probably approach that like what do you guys think yeah i i agree and you know when you're rehabbing from an injury, if you have a period where you had to reduce intensity, um, you know, I think that's a, as a coach, I would introduce, reintroduce a linear periodization for a short period of time and basically test or what I would call like testing the threshold um, where they can move uninhibited, you know, relatively pain-free. And then my, my thought process there is to gradually increase that threshold until you're basically back to, you know, kind of moving without a lot of pain and you can move on an uninhibited. Um, that's my, usually how I approach it. And, you know, I, I'll send an athlete to you or if someone qualified to help, you know, with more specifics in terms of getting to that point. But yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the rare times that, uh, for an athlete past the beginner phase where linear periodization is actually really useful. You just have to be smart about it and, you know, not, not overextend and just making sure you're staying within that threshold. Um, and, and usually it, it, it will increase and you can get back to a healthy, you know, kind of normal training. My, my thoughts on this, and this is going to run the risk of 
sorry, another one hour long conversation. Um, the idea of separating pain from injury, right? Uh, because a lot of people think I'm in pain, so I'm injured. And that, that a lot of the time that's not necessarily the case. Now I'm not a professional. And so I, I tend to avoid making those distinctions and, and I leave that to the professionals. But once that distinction is made, um, the question becomes, you know, what was a tolerable level of pain um, and uh, how comfortable are we to, to push that um, kind of envelope? So I know myself, uh, you know, I could be a big baby, but I'm also, when it comes to training, pretty pain tolerant. And so I, I could push myself pretty hard. It's, it's a client by client basis. You got to make sure you understand, you know, I, I can think of, I have a couple people in mind right now who, if they have a one out of 10 level of pain, they're going to be really upset with me if I push them to, to do a two. Um, so, I, you know, if adherence is our number one training variable, then we definitely don't want to do that. Um, but the idea of separating pain and injury, I think is an important one which we could probably do a, a, another seminar on. Yeah, I agree, actually. And also, I think that's why I, I made the distinction about moving uninhibited, because you can move, you can have pain that will force you to change your, you know, your motor pattern or how you're moving. And I think that's, that's for me, would be a hard line of like, okay, you need to reevaluate and, you know, kind of reassess that. But if you can move uninhibited how you normally would with, you know, a tolerable level of pain, then you, you you're probably safe to do so. But again, I, I try not to make those decisions because I don't think I'm qualified to make them. Clinton, should you give me any caveats on any of the stuff I just said? Um, no, I, I mean, again, like I, I think this is something that we all kind of agree on. Um, I, I, I think you guys are, are great in respecting like the scope of practice when it comes to like someone being in pain. But like Jordan, like you said, like pain is pain is different for everyone. Like Sometimes I wonder about this. Like sometimes I wonder, like you got so Tommy, right? Like I, I wonder sometimes if the stuff Tommy experiences on like a daily basis is the stuff that I see people getting treated for on a daily basis. And it's like sometimes it's it's frustrating, but also sometimes it's it allows it we just we, we can't do pain is such as like a unique experience per person that I we almost have to defer to what the individual like categorizes as pain right and and part of that it, it depending on the relationship between the coach and the athlete like they can figure out a way to figure out what is good pain and what is bad pain i love what joe said about like one of the distinguish the distinguishing factors between like like good pain and bad pain is whether or not they're having these aberrant movements that are that are causing these deviations that maybe like that that might impact performance right so I love that. Um, I, I think in addition to that, like qualification, I think um, the duration of the pain is also important too. So um, if someone has pain that is more along the lines of like a tendonitis, um, tendonitis pain is is okay to experience assuming that it returns to baseline within 24 hours. Uh, like Like research is showing that tendonitis rehab, like pain is going to be part of the process, right? So if someone has tendonitis and they have a 24 hour window before we consider that pain to be like, like bad, like if it extends beyond 24 hours, then like, okay, let's pull back a little bit. But someone without tendonitis, if they have pain that lasts like two hours or so, like after training, but then it goes away, they sleep fine that day, they wake up the next day, they feel relatively recovered, they can go into the next training session, like let let them let them experience that that little bit of pain, you know. Like I I think that's totally fine. I think not every type of pain needs to be pathologized, right? Not every ache in our low back is necessarily something that needs to be treated, right? Sometimes if you experience a pain in your low back, the answer is to continue to train, but just like adjust the parameters as needed to continue to train. So, um, I I think that ties together like what what I do and how like I don't really I don't really coach like powerlifting performance like that's I, I defer that to you guys like that's your wheelhouse but i do want to try to get their pain to be like manageable so that they can jump back onto programming with you like like as as easily as possible so yeah and just to piggyback on that and to not spend five hours on this i also think it uh over time right like training age is actually the biggest variable here 
and I'm going to use myself as an example, because as you know, you've been treating me for years and I've had low back pain and low back injuries for, you know, eight years now. And in the beginning, it was very much, you know, the onset of it was to me like a, you know, a catastrophe as I've heard you put it like, you know, this is the end, right? Like I'm done. Like I can't do this anymore. Like, but then as I continue to do this for a long period of time, it, it, becomes less severe and now it's very much reduced to can i train without having to um to you know alter how i'm training right and if so that pain is probably acceptable you know and if i can't then i need to kind of take a step back and, and figure out what's going on but i think that something like that actually is comes specifically with training age and maturity and self-awareness that can probably only occur if you've done this for a long period of time, which is true for most athletes, I think. All right, so let's open it up to questions in here and questions in the chat. Anybody wanna just shout something out? Don't be shy. In the meantime, we can look through the chat and see if there's anything interesting in there worth responding to. Justin had a question regarding massage. Do we lump deep tissue massage in with if it makes you feel good? Uh, I do. Um, that being said, I think there are also some physiological properties towards getting certain types of tissue like massage. Like if something has abnormal tone um, that could impair a performance. Like, like, I think there are some people, if they, let, let's say they experience some sort of tone issue, like their, their upper traps, for example, right? Like who hasn't experienced like a lot of tone in like their neck muscles. Um, sometimes people don't feel good when they're actually getting their upper traps massaged, but the day, a day later, like they feel all that tension released. Um, so I'm not sure if you're answering your question the way you intended, but that is an example of something that like, so, so yes, like if it makes you feel good, then I consider that like good recovery, but that's also an example of something that like, if it doesn't feel good in the moment, if it makes you experience some sort of, you know, bump up in performance, then that's uh, that's a legitimate way to utilize uh, deep tissue massage. Um, so we heard a lot from Jesse Ringel in the chat. I know Jesse had some strong feelings about getting out of the bar. You want to chime in? You want to maybe have a little mini debate here? <laughs> that that's actually Mike Boyle posing as as Jesse Ringel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <How are you? laughs> I'm, I'm I'm getting catfished. <laughs> yeah, no, I just I just had the opposite experience. I used to like do, I used to foam roll, dynamic stretching, static stretching, you know, the whole John Roos and whatever, all that whole five step shit for years. And then I just stopped and I haven't noticed any difference except yeah. that now I waste, somehow waste more time at the gym, but at least it seems like it's more productive. I don't know, but I haven't, you know, noticed any difference in terms of you, do you think maybe you'll take tissue quality food? injury? Sorry. Do you think maybe your technique has improved? Like maybe back then your technique wasn't as good and you were finding that you were having to do all these things to feel good. And now that your movement pattern is better or something like that, you're having to do this and you're not feeling as crappy afterwards because you're moving better. Oh no, I, I, I always felt good. I thought I had to do this or else I was going to not feel good. Oh uh, yeah. So I, I, um, I, Yeah, I think my technique is the, is the same, you know. All right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, he, you were influenced by a man of a, of a similar name, Jesse Starrett. Kelly Starrett. <laughs> Wait, Kelly, Star Kelly Starrett. Kelly, Kelly Starrett. Starrett. Oh. <laughs> you got me for a second. I was like, huh, wait, what? No, uh, Kelly. Suffer, <laughs> I read that book. That's a throwback, huh? Holy shit. Yeah, Supple Leopard. Yeah, exactly. All those, all those nice guys. No, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I've, my philosophy's changed a lot. Um, and I, th I think I was a victim to, uh, the, the, these nocebic ideas because all I, all I did, I'm talking about, I've just stopped, you know, I've been lifting for whatever, 15 years 
and I've, I stopped doing this whole, you know, 20 minute routine, I don't know, three years ago. So I just, there's no way that like anything else has significantly changed other than that's like a big change. <laughs> you know, I'm talking like a decade of doing this type of stuff. And then I just stopped just from reading, um, you know, stuff about foam rolling that it wasn't that, yeah, that it wasn't necessary to injury prevent, that there's no relationship between static stretching or posture and injury. And so I just stopped doing it and, you know, paid attention to all the things I've been paying attention, paying attention to before, frequency, volume, load, whatever, fatigue management, everything you guys have said. Uh, I just haven't noticed any difference. So uh, I can't, uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll be quick. Um, yeah, the, the, the Kelly Starrett, and I would also lump in CrossFit with that. I think CrossFit and Kelly Starrett um, piggybacked off each other for a while. And I think Kelly Starr built a career through CrossFit and, um, and preaching a lot of his methodologies. And then CrossFit started having prehab classes that they would do and things like that, um, which, which is wild to think about. Uh, it, it really ramped up the, um, the quantity, the volume of this kind of work that people thought was necessary. And way back in you know, 2010, um, there was good research that showed that the most um, effective uh, prehab is just a short dynamic warm up, right? So we're talking about sub five minutes, um, like three minutes. And that did show statistical uh, improvement in, in injury outcomes. So I think it, it, it's, it's something that should be separated. The idea that um, massive volumes of prehab, um, you should poison the well for any sort of, um, any sort of, prescriptive uh, warm-up yeah well, i would okay. yeah i would push back on that like where what study and what was they what were they actually comparing because if we go back to the clinton's you know overall philosophy of uh what's sorry what's the formula again uh yeah load greater than capacity equals tissue if, if i'm gonna squat what's wrong with just you know playing with the excuse me, the tempo the load and gradually progressing that as you, again, just going by subjective feel the same way you do with all these other prehab modalities anyway, right? You're, you're rolling the quads until it feels good or whatever. So why don't I just warm up until I feel good under the bar? But let's say, remember that in that equation, load doesn't, doesn't just refer to mechanical load. And um, let's say, just to play devil's advocate, I, don't, I, this is, I don't believe in this hard one way or the other, but let's say doing that dynamic warm up um, prepa prepares you mentally to take on more allostatic load so it's it's not so much the the stretch itself that better prepares you to take on the workload it's like it's like the ritual of doing it and and the the mental almost like placebo right so I, again, like I think this is right. a good way to kind of reconcile the like what I think everyone is saying here. I do feel like we're all still on the same page to some degree, right? Like I think we can all agree that it depends on the training age of the person. I, it depends on what movements they're going to do. Um, it even depends on like I'll give you an example, like like deadlifting, right? Like my my range of motion for like for for a conventional deadlift. I don't really need to warm up beyond like for that too much other than like warming up with with the bar. But if I'm doing a sumo deadlift and I'm like I'm trying to spread the floor, I'm trying to externally rotate my hips, I'm I'm trying to like really wedge myself and get into a good position there, I feel a lot better doing like hip cars and and joint capsule work and and stretching my hips dynamically into abduction and external rotation because it, it just primes my nervous system a lot more for for doing like the sumo deadlift right so you, you could argue that like oh why don't i just do like a lot of sumo deadlifts with like really lightweight would that give me the same effect i don't think it would because i don't i don't think it's getting the same accessory because i'm not getting the same accessory motions in my joint as i would doing like internal rotation work right like if if this is my hip and I'm doing lots of hip cars and isometrics and external rotation stuff, I'm getting a lot more communication through that joint surface than I would if I was just doing a sumo deadlift, right? Um, that's if I'm feeling achy. So what? <laughs> so what? You're, just, you're saying that it's different is all I'm hearing. 
Yeah, it's not necessarily better or worse. It depends on the person. Depends how recovered they are. No, no, I'm saying you're saying you're getting like different actions at the hip and they're talking differently than they would in the sumo. And that's, that's like right. objectively true. But it's I think a, you're it, applying, I think you're saying that it's that it's good or beneficial. And I feel like that's like a big maybe or a leap. And like it's like it's such a specific context. Like you don't mm. you don't have to sumo. Maybe it's just not maybe it's your anatomy and you need to do all these things because it's not a good movement for you. And you're doing it for whatever reason, which is okay. You can do whatever the fuck you want for whatever the fuck you want. I just mean Yeah. It's so I'll I'll just I'll just revise one thing. I didn't I didn't say it's good. I said it's it's different. So right. so that and and secondarily, if if you're introducing some sort of diversity and you're diversifying like what your nervous system is perceiving, that could have some benefit. But it, is it inherently good to do that? No. Does everyone need to do it? No. Right. That's why when I see dudes like come in and just start pulling and like, like, like I was, I was clanning Jordan before about it. Right. He comes in, he pulls like, like my, my working set for like a warm up, Right. And then he goes to the next guy's platform. He's like, all right, now I'm pulling like 495. Like I, he's, he's, he's well adapted to do that. If I did that, I'd be, I'd be like lying on the floor. Cause like my hips would be like so freaking sore, you know? So, um, for, you could say right. like, I'll, I'll concede that like, for me, it is beneficial on certain lifts to do dynamic warm ups that give me some sort of diverse uh, joint motion. Um, but I will mm -hmm. concede that in other people with different training histories that have different goals and maybe different leverages and zoom and deadlift styles, it may not be beneficial that like, I wouldn't say that you have to do like these, these dynamic things. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. That's all that I came to, to feel or understand is I thought all of this was, true i literally with every single client would roll and do this dynamic stuff no matter no matter what yeah and now I, I don't think i do any you know i what's the i'm sure you're all familiar maybe this is the dynamic more if you were kind of referring to like the what do they call it the well, the world's greatest stretch kind of thing. oh yeah yeah the yoga plex or whatever yeah i like yeah. that man i do i do that all the time yeah, no, hey, nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I would literally do it dogmatically with every single uh, person. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think we're all in agreement that um, there, there there's a, a very easy to overdo it, and there there isn't a lot of evidence that doing even moderate volume uh, warm ups will reduce injury risk. Uh, I'll get you that citation, Jesse. Um, I don't know how I'll do it. I'll find you and I'll send it to you. Uh, do we have, I think we, we have somebody else here in the chat. Do we have any other questions for anybody? I see people trickling out. I, uh, I have a question for Clinton just to, in regards to, um, to PRI. Like I know the PRI has a lot of really good application for just like um, injury prevention in general, but what, what are your thoughts on PRI application to powerlifting training? Like, do you, do you think it's useful or are you kind of in the middle? Cause I've talked to a lot of people that kind of, uh, you know, on the fence about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question, man. I'm actually working on a, like a blog post that, that goes into a lot of detail about my thoughts on PRI. Um, I have some big qualms with the, the foundations of PRI. I think a lot of it is based on pseudoscience. That being yeah. said, I think there are a lot of people that claim they use PRI and that it has good effects on their athletes. And I don't deny that at all. My, my only beef with PRI is the narratives they put behind it, right? PRI yeah. says, because we are asymmetrical human beings, we have to do very rigid patterns of movement and breathing and muscular contractions to offset the asymmetry that our bodies are producing. And I, I think that is not only not true, I think it's dangerous to pass on that message, right? Um, but if someone claim, if there's a coach, like a powerlifting coach and says like, hey, I learned this, this, this contract, this like side-lying, like hip breathing flex cool. breathing type thing. And then when I try it for my, my athletes and they get up and they move around, they're like, hey, I noticed a difference there. Like, I feel like it helps me better for when I get into my squat. I feel like I get into a better, my, my hip just flexes more. I get to depth more. 
Like, I, I think that's a very legitimate phenomenon, right? Like, I think, I think that's okay. So that's why PRI, sure. like, I have beef with PRI, but at the same time, PRI is not, like, irreconcilable to me. I, I just think they have to shift their narrative behind it and say that, like, PRI application is, like, let's let's test a hypothesis, right? Like, let's give this person a movement where, theoretically, if they do it, if they perceive, like, more comfort doing this, this, this exercise, then I'm going to keep doing them. Like, I, I think that's rehab in a nutshell, right? It's, like, hypothesizing what might make a positive effect on, on someone's performance and taking away that which is not useful and promoting the patterns and, and movements and stuff like that, that, that are useful. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the best way I can kind of answer that question. I think, I think there are a lot of people that like take it like way too far. Like, like I, like I took a PRI course. I don't think people realize that people like, the, the originators of PRI think like you have these bones in your head called like your sphenoids. They think the plates in your skull move up and down the same way your pelvis move up and down, right? <laughs> and, be, and because PRI people believe that there's some sort of asymmetry, like they think everyone is like this. So they're like, okay, if, if everybody is asymmetrically like this and your sphenoids are the pelvis of your head, I got to move my mandible like this so that so that my my vision like it's crazy like it sounds like i'm just making up some bullshit but like this is like truly what a lot of pri enthusiasts believe so Yikes. um yeah all that stuff in left field i think needs to die but all the good <laughs> practical stuff that people take from pri i think it can be useful right yeah so I, I could talk forever about this but uh that, that's the best <laughs> way i could i could i can answer I'm, it you know i'm glad i i'm glad i uh, got you on it uh, <laughs> uh great well is this is this the end Seems like it. I'm hungry. Any anybody else want to prevent Joe from eating? You didn't eat yet, dude. I've not eaten. <laughs> You're crazy. You should yeah. be eating. You should have ate during this. I should have fucking starving. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming, and thanks, you know, eleven of you for sticking around to the end. We'll have this. Uh, this has been recording the whole time, so we'll have this up, um, and. If you ever want to come in and chat about this stuff in person, you could talk to Clinton at the Williamsburg location, um, Joe usually at the Williamsburg location, Shane usually at the Bushwick location, um, and Nikhil is is bopping around. I don't even know where Nikhil usually is. Long Island? Is that Williamsburg? Williamsburg. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I appreciate you all for, for joining. And we have next week, I'll be doing my talk on velocity-based training. And I took some feedback from the last time, and I'll be expanding on that a lot. Um, so if you're into, into velocity-based training, or if you want to, I don't, know, I don't know if any of Joe or Shane's clients are here, but if you guys do velocity-based training, it's very helpful. And if you've been thinking about it, we got devices at both locations, and so you can use them there. But uh, until then, it's good to have you guys. Cool. Thanks, Clinton. Thank Thanks you. for having Thanks, me. Clinton. Really appreciate being here. I loved it. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah. See you guys. See you guys. Right, good night.